Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 287 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and I'm joined today by Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. I'm joined today by you. <laughs> and this is an episode that we recorded a few months ago to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash StarQuest for their generosity in making this and all our shows at StarQuest possible. We gave them early exclusive access, but now we're sharing it with you to show you one of the benefits of being a patron. Uh, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about, did Jesus suffer more than a normal human could endure? Uh, does God let demons to protect us for his, God's purposes? Did Adam have a wife named Lilith? Would intelligent apes, like from the Planet of the Apes, or would the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles go to heaven? What do out-of-body experiences tell us about the soul? What was the Tower of Babel? Was there an original world language? Who was St. Paul's in-time man of lawlessness? What have I, Jimmy, learned from Mysterious World? What was Veronica's veil? And things like that. Excellent. So, folks, please enjoy the show. So our first question comes from Colleen, who asks, I remember hearing as a kid that during Jesus' passion, he suffered enough to kill a man seven times over. Did Jesus suffer more than a hu normal human could endure? Well, this is a pious claim that you sometimes hear. I've encountered it myself. However, we don't have good evidence for it, and I would be personally be skeptical of it. The reason is Jesus, or one of the reasons, is Jesus assumed a fully human nature. He did not assume a superhuman nature. And so since he had a human nature, that would mean that he could suffer as much as a normal human could. Um, so the same wounds that would kill a normal person would kill him, unless God did a miracle, did something beyond human nature in order to keep him alive. But kind of the whole point of the crucifixion was not keeping Jesus alive. So God was not doing a miracle to let him survive. And in fact, the, the Gospel of Mark uh, indicates that Pilate was surprised that Jesus died so fast. Um, he sent a centurion to check on it, and or at least he confirmed it with a centurion. And Pilate was used to sending people to be crucified, so he knew how long they could typically survive. And so it it didn't this doesn't suggest that Jesus endured a superhuman amount of punishment and lived longer than a, a normal person would. Um, so I would say that I would be skeptical of the claim. Uh, it, you know, his suffering was extremely intense, but I would just say we don't have good evidence of him suffering beyond what a normal human would, um, both given the data in the Bible and given his, his fully human nature. All right. Our next question comes from Rob, who asks, in the screw tape letters, Wormwood is told to protect his patient from death in order to extend his life and give a better chance to bring him to the dark side. What would be the implications if be if demons do protect us from harm, especially if we've been praying for protection? Could it just be God making a mockery out of the demons? Well, that's how I take it. You know, if uh, if uh, if a demon protects you from a danger in order to keep you alive longer in hopes of tempting you to go dark side, you know, maybe by offering you cookies or something, um, th that would be part of God's providence. So God would allow the demon to protect you in that way, but God would do it for his own purposes, presumably to help you stay on the light side or do more good in the world or something like that. And so that would thwart the demon's plan. The demon would be using uh, his own abilities for his own ends, but God would basically subvert that and use the demon's abilities for his ends, for God's ends. So, you know, if God wants us protected, we'll be protected. And hypothetically, God could allow a demon to unintentionally, you know, serve 
in that purpose. Um, th the only question I'd have is whether mockery is really the best way to conceptualize this, at least in a literal sense. I don't have any problem, you know, like in uh, the Psalms where it talks about God laughs at the proud or laughs at, you know, people who are thwarting his, or who, who set themselves against him and want to undo God's plans. You know, I don't take that literally. God doesn't literally mock people. But, uh, and I would say the same thing in this case, God is not literally mocking demons, but he would be using them to serve his own purposes against their own interests. All right. Our next question comes from Alex, who asks, did Adam have a wife, Lilith, before Eve? And if so, what happened to her? Well, um, it, the character Lilith, uh, as Adam's uh, first wife is an idea that we find in some Jewish folklore. Uh, this is post-biblical folklore. It's in rabbinic Judaism. And the rabbis had some interesting stories about Lilith. Um, sort of my favorite one involves the, the biblical Eve being Adam's third wife. Um, in one version of the story, God makes Lilith as Adam's first wife, and she makes he makes Lilith from the same dirt that he made Adam from. So she's fully equal to Adam. She's just as smart as Adam. She's equal in every way, and she has just as much ambition as Adam. And she won't be submissive as a wife. She doesn't want to assume certain postures during intimate time that are otherwise common. And I hope I said that. I said that delicately. I hope it's clear enough for the adults in the audience. Um, let's just say she she didn't want to be uh, supine, and and so she's she's not really working out as a wife. So God separates them, and then He makes a second wife for Adam. And this wife He makes from not from the fine dirt that he made, or dust that he made Adam from. Instead, he makes this one from really dark earth, really, you know, like peaty, boggy, something, really, really dark, coarse earth. And the problem with the new wife, who is the first Eve, is she's too stupid. She's not equal to Adam, not remotely. And so she's not a good wife either, and so God separates them, and then God makes the third wife from Adam's rib. And so she's she's on a par with Adam, but she doesn't have the the hubris and ambition that Lilith did, and so she's 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 a good wife. And so it's like Goldilocks and the three bears. The first wife is too haughty, the second wife is too slow, but the third wife is just right. And and so that's a kind of interesting story, but it's just a story. It's from, you know, medieval Jewish folklore. There is a reference to Lilith in the Bible. The term does appear. It's in Isaiah 34, 14, and that passage says, And the desert creatures shall meet with hyenas, and a goat demon shall call to his neighbor. Surely there Lilith shall repose, and she shall find a resting place for herself. So we've got this poetic passage in Isaiah that's talking about a desert location, somewhere out in the boonies, out in the wilderness, where you have these various creatures, which are a little scary. And it's been proposed by some scholars that in this passage, Lilith is some kind of desert-dwelling animal, maybe like a screech owl or another kind of night bird. Um, but other scholars have said, no, they don't think that's what Lilith is in this passage. Um, instead, they would say this is kind of a naturalizing of Isaiah, of, of reading obscure Hebrew terms in naturalistic terms like animals, but the Hebrews had a more supernatural worldview than that. So yeah, they do talk about animals living in the desert, but they also talk about demons living in the desert. And that's what other scholars think Lilith refers to in this passage, not an animal, not a wife of Adam, but instead a kind of harmful demon, and specifically a demon from uh, the ancient Near East in Assyrian mythology named Lilitu. And you can see how Lilitu, now Assyrian endings often have an oo on the end, like Elu for God instead of El. 
Um, and so if you take Lili to and whack off the U, you get Lilit, which would then in some pronunciations of Hebrew become Lilith. And so it's thought that perhaps the reference here is to a demoness, because it does use feminine um, word endings and pronouns for Lilith in, uh, in Hebrew. So, uh, so that seems to be probably the best bet uh, to my mind. I don't have firm opinions on this, but I would guess that the biblical ref- reference to Lilith is probably to a demonic figure. Then Ryan asks, Jimmy, you've talked about the religious implications of alien life. What about the implications of a planet of the apes or ninja turtles situation? Assuming animal souls don't go to heaven, would the rational souls of the intelligent apes and turtles go to heaven? Would their human level intelligence mean they're made in the image and likeness of God? Also, when are you planning to do an episode on the T-Rex? Okay, so um, the first thing to say is you've said assuming that a rational soul is needed to to survive death, and I, we can make that assumption. Um, personally, I'm very skeptical of that. As I talked about in episode 203 on Animal Afterlife, which you can get to by going to mysterious.fm slash 203, I actually am not convinced by the arguments that say you need a rational soul in order to survive death. And I think we actually have some surprising experiential evidence that at least some animals do survive death. So I don't really buy that assumption, but we can go with it. So let's suppose that you need a rational soul to survive death, and you've got a Planet of the Apes or a Ninja Turtle situation. What would happen when they die? Well, since they have rational souls, they would survive death. But would that mean they go to heaven? Not necessarily, because just because you survive death doesn't mean you have a vocation to be with God in heaven. That's something that God offered to our race. So he gave us a vocation or calling to be with him in heaven um, in the afterlife, you know, and even after the resurrection, we're going to be spiritually united with him, which is the essence of what heaven is. But God didn't have to do that. Theologians down through the ages have talked about how this is a gift that God gave our race. He didn't have to do it. Um, Even assuming he let us survive death, or even if he let us be immortal, uh, he could, he could, he didn't have to call us to be with him. He could leave us in paradise on earth, for example. And so, and similarly, you could be in a happy state in the afterlife, you know, assuming you weren't a sinner and you received, or you were and received God's grace. Uh, The apes or the Ninja Turtles could could be in a paradisical environment in the afterlife, but still not have the supernatural calling to be with God in heaven. So it would really depend on what God chose to do with them. Now, um, we we have two test cases here. We've got the angels who they have a vocation to be with God, and they're, they're, they have ras- they're rational spirits. And we have humans, and we have a vocation to be with God, and we have rational spirits. So you could argue, based on those two sample cases, that the same thing would be true of intelligent apes or intelligent turtles. Um, you can argue that, and if I had to bet, I would bet that they would have a vocation to be with God in heaven. But we got to be a little careful here because we've only got a sample size of two. And um, N equals two makes for a, a study that doesn't have very high confidence levels because there could be lots of other races that God maybe let survive death but doesn't call to be with him, and we just don't know about them. So I'd say if I had to bet... I would bet that such creatures would have a heavenly vocation, but I'm cautious about that because we only have a sample size of two and God hasn't told us the answer. When it comes to um, them having the image of God, it's going to depend on what your theory of the image of God is. Historically, there have been a lot of thinkers who have tried to link the image of God to a specific attribute that humans have, like intelligence, for example, or you know, some other attribute that we have. But the current scholarship is skeptical of that, and current theology 
is also skeptical of that. Instead, if I can articulate it in a somewhat simple way, it seems that according to the best current research and thought, what the image of God is, is not a specific attribute like intelligence or spirituality or anything like that. Instead, it's the capacity to represent God. And so, you know, like an image of a king represents the king. And so the image of God represents God. And that's, that's why in Genesis, mankind is made in God's image and then told to rule creation on his behalf. We are God's steward to rule his creation, and we represent him to the creation. So like if you have uh, a king and he he gives orders and whoever implements those orders is acting on behalf of the king and in some way representing the king, just like an image represents a king, a statue of a king represents the king. And so that's kind of the current biblical theological thought on what the image of God represents or is. So if on the planet of the apes, the apes had been given a commission like Adam and Eve to rule the planet of the apes on God's behalf, then they would be exercising uh, and displaying the image of God. They would be functioning as divine imagers to that domain, just like we function as God's imagers in this domain on Earth. What about the case of the mutant Ninja Turtles? Well, um, so I I remember I was a comic book fan. I was reading comic books when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started, but I've never really read them myself. But my understanding is that their adventures take place on Earth, and Earth already has an intelligent race that does image God, namely us, human beings. And the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are sort of functioning alongside of us. And so you could look at them in terms of the image of God in a couple of different ways. You could say, well, no, they're not humans, so they don't have a mandate to rule the earth from God, so they're not representing him. On the other hand, you could say, yeah, but they've got, uh, they've got moral, they have a moral structure as entities, they're doing good, they're fighting evil, and so they are, in a sense, uh, you know, representing God uh, in the world and trying to do God's will, even if they don't realize it, just like many humans don't realize that that's what they're doing. And so even though they aren't humans, you could look at them and say, but they're sharing in the image of God. They are, in a sense, representing God in this domain in the same way humans are. So even though they're not humans, they're sharing in the human vocation of serving as God's image. Finally, I have done preliminary research for a T-Rex episode, and it is definitely on the list. I plan to talk about T-Rexes in the future. Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. Uh, Mary asks, if scientists can link out-of-body experiences to a part of the brain, what does that mean for the soul? I learned about this from a science podcast called Shortwave and would love your take. Well, I haven't had a chance to listen to the podcast, but um, if and there have been attempts to link out of body experiences to various parts of the brain, but it really doesn't have any implications for the existence of a soul. Uh, souls are not empirically measurable and souls do work through the brain and through other parts of the body. Um, just because we can associate pumping blood with our heart doesn't really tell us anything about the soul. Um, and similarly, if there was an ability associated with to have out of body experiences with a particular part or sets of part of the parts of the brain, that really wouldn't tell us anything about the soul either. It's debated in parapsychology whether anything leaves the body at all 
in the course of an out-of-body experience. According to one theory, uh, humans have a, a, a form that back in the days of theosophy and still in theosophical circles is called the astral body. Uh, modern parapsychologists don't use that term for it because it's specific to, you know, one religious system, the theosophical system. Um, and the idea is this this astral form or body or something leaves the human body and goes elsewhere and has experiences, but is still linked to the body. Now, this would not presumably be our intellectual soul because our intellectual soul is the form of the body that's uh, that's keeping our keeping our body alive, and if it left, we would die. The most that could happen is that the intellectual soul could potentially, hypothetically, manifest in more than one location. I mean, it could. Souls don't really have physical forms, at least according to a popular belief. You know, Aquinas would, for example, would say soul doesn't really have uh, a physical form. When we talk about a spirit interacting or being in a place, what all that means is the spirit, which itself does not have a spatial location, is manifesting in that place. It's, it's affecting it by its abilities. So we could say metaphorically that an angel is in the city of Jerusalem if the angel is causing stuff to happen in the city of Jerusalem. It's not literally there. It doesn't literally have a spatial location because it's a spirit, but um, but it is, um, it's causing effects in a location, and so we can metaphorically describe it as being in that location. And you could argue the same thing would be true of our souls, that they don't literally have a spatial location, but because they're affecting our body and making it live, we can metaphorically describe the soul as being in the body. And then if the soul stops affecting the body, it is no longer in the body, and the body is dead. At least that's true of the intellectual soul. Um, but <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, there was also a theory that we may have more than one soul. And these days, they don't tend to be called souls. Instead, they tend to be called forms. And you'll find this, for example, in the thought of Blessed John Dun Scotus, uh, who came about a century after. St. Thomas Aquinas, a little bit after Aquinas. And, and he uh, was of the opinion that we have many different forms in our bodies. Um, we have one overall substantial form, and that's the intellectual soul. But unlike Aquinas, he thought we had these other ones. So for example, your heart would have a form that would make it a heart, and your liver would have a form that would make it your liver. And so if, if Duns Scotus' theory is true, and we have multiple forms, then hypothetically one of our forms could extend or leave, and we would not die. So there could be a way of understanding how, uh, on a Christian metaphysics, on how something could leave the body. It wouldn't be the intellectual soul that's keeping us alive, but it could be one of these other forms. Or... On Aquinas's view, if we have just the one form, then it could maybe manifest in two places because it doesn't have a physical location itself. So it, if it can manifest in our bodies, it might be able to also manifest elsewhere. And that could be what's responsible for, um, for out-of-body experiences. Or there's another possible metaphysic, which says that, um, that there is a kind of spiritual stuff that our souls are made out of, and this stuff could be malleable. It could extend. We could exude like a like a, a like a microorganism extending a pseudopod. We could extend some of this spiritual stuff to go elsewhere. So all of those are possible. Um, which fa theory you'll favor on a Christian point of view will depend on which Christian metaphysics you endorse. But um, as I so often point out, it 
it isn't all Aquinas. He doesn't speak for the church. This is a matter of opinion, and there are different ideas about how body and soul relate in Christianity. What we can say with confidence is if the spiritual soul simply left, we would be dead. And that's actually been um, uh, an idea that's been endorsed by some out-of-body experiencers. Uh, like I said, there is a debate in parapsychology about whether anything actually leaves the body. One individual who thought the answer was yes was a psychic named Alex Tanous. And Alex Tanous uh, was proficient at having out-of-body experiences. They did laboratory tests on him, so they'd, they'd get him in a room and they'd isolate him and they'd have a test object in a distant room that he couldn't see. And they'd say, okay, now we want you to leave your body and go to the room down the hall and tell us what you see. And sometimes they would even have other tests for him, like to try to see if anything is leaving his body. He believed the answer is yes. He uh, referred to the version of him that left his body as Alex II. So Alex I is, you know, locked in the room in one part of the laboratory, and Alex II leaves Alex I's body and goes and looks and sees what the target is and then reports it. And they asked, well, do you think your soul is leaving your body? And Alex Tanous said, oh, no, I'd be dead. So, you know, this, this idea that there's something leaving, but it's not the soul, has some traction. And that, that's what Alex Tanous reported his experience was. But not everybody agrees with that. Um, it's possible that I, I, I actually I wanted to mention some sometimes they would set a test for Alex where they would put like an object on a strain gauge and they would in the in the distant room and they would say, OK, Alex, we want you when you get to the other room, when Alex, too, gets to the other room, we want him to pull on the strain gauge. And and that'll signify that this is more than just you're mentally perceiving it because you're actually having a physical effect. If you pull on the object that's attached to the strain gauge, then we can see the strain gauge moving, and that'll tell us there's a physical effect going on here, which could support the idea that something is actually leaving your body. The problem is that can be interpreted other ways because psychokinesis is an ability that, you know, where it's reported you can move a distant object without actually touching it. So it's possible that instead of actually leaving, having something leave his body, what Alex Tanous was doing was just mentally perceiving a distant room and psychokinetically affecting the object attached to the strain gauge. So it doesn't prove that something was really leaving his body. And that would be a view that would be endorsed by other out-of-body experiencers. For example, um, I know a, a British out-of-body experiencer named uh, Graham Nichols. I took a class from him. And uh, I don't have out-of-body experiences myself, but I took his class just to learn about him. And he uh, is proficient with out-of-body experiences. I, I, I'm hoping to interview him in the future on the show because some of his are very interesting, but he doesn't think anything leaves his body. Um, he thinks it's a kind of traveling clairvoyance where instead of just remotely viewing one location, you kind of remote view near your body and then travel where you're viewing to a distant location. And so presumably he would look at Alex Tanusa's experience and say, yeah, he, he just he shifted his point of view from away from his body to another room, and then he psychokinetically affected an object on a strain gauge, strain gauge but nothing literally left him. And so it's, uh, it's debated exactly how this works. And uh, consequently, um, even if we establish certain, and I'm sure there are certain brain regions that are associated with these phenomena, but even if there are, it doesn't really tell us about the soul for the reasons I've gone into. The situ there are too many different competing ways to analyze the situation, and so we couldn't really draw any firm conclusions about the soul from them. And our next question comes from Christopher, who asks, uh, Greetings, Jimmy. As a language lover and amateur linguist, I've wondered often of the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. In your own research, is there archaeological evidence for such a construction? Furthermore, could there have been a single worldwide language at one point in history? 
Thank you kindly. Okay, so the uh, scholars have generally thought in recent times that the Tower of Babel is based on uh, Mesopotamian ziggurats. Uh, ziggurats were basically temples. It's sort of a cross between a temple and a pyramid. You've got this big, tall vertical structure. It's not exactly a pyramid, but it is a big, tall vertical structure, and it's got a temple on the top, and that's what a ziggurat is. And in and they built these in Mesopotamia, you know, in Babylon and Sumeria and places like that. And specifically, it's been proposed that the Tower of Babel may be based on a specific ziggurat, which was a Sumerian. Uh, it was a it was a temple at Babylon, and its name was Etemenanki, which is in Sumerian it means Temple of the Foundation of Heaven and Earth. And so that's a little bit of an ambitious name. And uh, so if you've got the temple of the foundation of heaven and earth, well, you could see how that might lead to a story about a ziggurat or tower called Gate of Heaven. And so it's thought that, that, this, that either this ziggurat or ziggurats in general are what the author of Genesis is envisioning when he's writing about the so-called Tower of Babel. Only, you know, they did it, it was a big tall structure, which is what a tower is, but they didn't have the uh, I guess they didn't have a word for ziggurat in Hebrew, so they just used the word tower instead because it's a big tall structure. In terms of a worldwide language, um, actually this is a popular theory among linguists that there was a worldwide or at least an original language that existed probably tens of thousands of years ago. And they've given it a name. They call it Proto-World. And uh, one joke is in linguistics is, you know, if you ever want to freak a linguist out, tell them you're a native speaker of Proto-World. Um, there probably would have been, uh, certainly would have been precedents before proto-world developed. Um, you know, we see more primitive communication systems um, in other creatures, and there would have been some, there would have been more primitive communication systems before the development of proto-world. Some of them may have been gestural languages rather than spoken languages. We even see our close relatives, the primates, using pointing behavior to uh, to communicate. And so it's quite possible that humans started communication with sign language and that sign language may have preceded spoken language. Um, but at some point, uh, and then also there would have been more primitive spoken languages, you know, where you use sounds to communicate. But at some point you got something that basically approximated a a a modern language in terms of its expressive power, where you could express the same kinds of thoughts that we can express today in this first language that developed. And that's what Proto-World would have been. Now, not everybody in the population would have spoken Proto-World, but Proto-World would have been the first truly modern language, which then, because of its how useful it is, it, it would have rapidly spread throughout the human community because um, it, it made things so much easier. I, I remember reading one book on linguistics where the author was, uh, I forget who she was, but the author was talking about what heady days it must have been when the first human community got a fully modern language. I, I mean, they could communicate, they could tell each other things, at a, even at a distance that they needed to know so they could outcompete other humans and impose their will on them and 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 get what they wanted you know you can imagine how it would be easier coordinating a battle or an attack plan or something if you've got language and your opponent doesn't so um so needless to say uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and if you're in the people who don't have the modern language and you're getting your butts kicked by the people who do, you're going to learn their language really fast. 
because you don't want to be at a perpetual disadvantage. So Proto World would have sped, spread very rapidly through the human community, which at this time would have, in all, would, it would have been in all likelihood confined to Africa. Um, can we figure out very much about this language? Well, a lot of linguists are skeptical. They think Proto World existed so long ago that there's really nothing we can infer about it other than maybe some general characteristics that all languages have in common. But we couldn't, for example, figure out individual words in Proto World. But not everyone agrees. Um, there are a few scholars who think it is possible to, to reconstruct some of the original proto-world vocabulary. And the way they do that, or the way they try to pursue that, is basically how we reconstructed the Indo-European language system. Um, Indo-European is the language family that English and German and Sanskrit and basically all of the major languages in Europe and India belong to. And it was noticed back in the, I guess, 1800s that they share a lot of really common vocabulary. Now, some of the development of some languages in that family is obvious. For example, the Romance languages like Spanish, French, Romanian, Italian, they're all versions of Latin. And so if you look in, in Spanish and Italian and Romanian and... Um, and, and French, the, uh, the word for a thing is going to be very similar, and it's going to be based on a Latin root. So, for example, um, the word for king in Latin is rex, and in these other languages, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a very, something that's based on rex. You know, originally there was this rex word, and then it diversified into the various words for king in the languages that descended from Latin, the Romance languages. But English and German are not part of, are not Romance languages. So they have a different word. The word king or König in German doesn't sound anything like Rex. So it's clearly a different one. But what they found is as you look at the different European and Indian languages, India, India, uh, India, Indian, they, they have enough vocabulary in common that you can reconstruct primitive roots. It looks like there was an original language, now called Indo-European, that was the ancestor of all of these others. And so you can learn a lot about the vocabulary of Indo-European by tracing the commonalities in different branches of the Indo-European language family. Well, what some scholars have done is try to do the same thing with other um, language families. For example, here in the Americas, there are, I think, three different major language families among Native American languages. And they some scholars have looked at them and said, and this is a little bit controversial, but they, they've looked at them and said, you know, these look like variations on, on, on an original language, that there was an original root language that people coming over the, um, the, the Bering Strait land bridge would have spoken that then gave rise to all of the different modern Native American languages, and we can reconstruct some of its vocabulary. And what some scholars have done, in particular a, a scholar named Merritt Rulin, R-U-H-L-E-N, um, is try to do the same thing with all of the world's language families and find common roots that for at least some words that all of the different language families seem to have. And he wrote about this in a book called The Origin of Language. Now, most scholars are very skeptical of Rulin's claims to have reconstructed vocabulary from tens of thousands of years back in human history and thus identified proto-world words. But I read his book, and he makes a fascinating case. I don't know whether I believe it or not, but it's a fascinating case. And if you want to read it, you know, feel free. It's, a, it's an interesting read. Um, he claims to be able to identify not a huge number of words, but, a, but several. Um, the, he, he identifies a word for father and a word for mother and a word 
for like brother or sister, I forget which, and also a word for water and a word for finger. And off the top of my head, because I didn't look this up before we started recording, but off the top of my head, he 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 thinks the proto word proto world word for water was qua. And he thinks the proto world word for finger was tick. And and you know, he bases this on finding sounds like qua that mean water in vastly separated families of languages and he and and similarly finding words that sound like tick that mean finger in widely separated families of languages um now i find tick interesting because there's nothing uh, there's nothing particularly about a finger that would make you associate it with that sound i'm more skeptical of qua because a lot of early humans lived in caves you know we found their art and um and water in caves drips and the sound of dripping water could be could be interpreted in human speech as qua 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 you know as you can imagine that dripping water sound and so it could be that the reason qua like aqua or agua appears in different languages is it's an automatopoeia, a, a sound alike word based on a natural phenomenon. On the other hand, that doesn't disprove qua as the proto world um, word for water because it could have been automatopoeia that let the proto world speakers give it its name. So I think it's very interesting, but um, it's it's highly controversial in scholarship, and not many scholars think it's actually possible to reconstruct proto-world words. Our next question comes from Alex, who asks, Did Mary of Agreda really bilocate from Spain to New Mexico, or is that just a legend? Well, I've encountered the claim, but I haven't researched it thoroughly yet. Um, you know, the claim is that St. Mary of Agreda appeared to Native Americans, and she was wearing blue and became known as the Lady in Blue, and she did a kind of evangelization that led the Native Americans to be ready for evangelization by missionaries when the missionaries got there. And um, and I'm familiar with the claims. Uh, I plan to research it. I have not researched it yet. But I do plan to research it, and I'll be very interested to see what I find. It would be very interesting if I'm able to confirm that this that we have good evidence that this actually happened. Our next question comes from John, who says, Hi, Jimmy and Dom. In Second Thessalonians 2, 3 to 10, is St. Paul referring to a contemporary figure such as a Roman leader, or is he referring to a future figure, or maybe both? When he mentions Jesus slaying him with his breath, it seems to point to a future person. But the context also seems to suggest a figure of Paul's time. Please enlighten us. Yeah, so I'll let people go read uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 for themselves if they like. I won't read the whole thing here. Um, but it does refer to an individual, a man of lawlessness that is going to be unleashed at some point in the future from Paul's perspective and that Jesus will uh, slay with the breath of his mouth at his coming. He also says this figure will uh, seat himself in the temple of God and and portray himself as a god. Um, now, I had to work through this in some detail a few years ago. Um, I have a long-term project I'd like to complete, although Mysterious World kind of takes up a lot of writing time. Um, but I'd like to write a commentary on the entire New Testament. And as part of that, I have already written a gospel on Mark, which I've published at with Logos Bible Software. And I also have completed, but not published, a, a commentary on First and Second Thessalonians, which appear to be the earliest of Paul's epistles. The only competitor for that title would be Galatians, but it appears to be First and Thess Second Thessalonians. They were written about the year A.D. 50, and only a few months apart, or even weeks apart. Um, in them, St. Paul is clearing up some confusion that the Thessalonians had about the end of the world, because he hadn't been able to stay with them very long. If you read 
the book of Acts, you find out that he was only in Thessalonica for a very brief time, I think like three weeks, if memory serves, and then he was driven out of the town by a riot and had to escape. And so he only had a brief time to give the Thessalonians an education in the Christian faith, and consequently, um, they, they, they had a lot of confusion after he, they were deprived of him. And they it seems that one of the ideas that some of them had may have been that if you're not alive at the time of the second coming, you're not going to get into the kingdom. And that caused a problem because some of them had died, you know, and they had loved ones who had died. And it's like, are they not going to get in the kingdom? Because they're not going to be alive when Jesus comes back. And Paul writes him and he says, this is in First Thessalonians, he says, guys, don't worry about it. Um, the dead are actually going to rise first, and then we'll all get to be with Jesus. So don't worry about that. And he gave them other information about the end times. And then they didn't understand that. And and so they so in Second Thessalonians he has another bite at the apple and tries to or another swing at the pinata and tries to clarify things further and so he starts talking about the the day of the Lord is not going to come because some of them had the idea the day of Lord, the Lord has already come and we somehow missed it. Um, it's, it's, it's not going to come until this rebellion comes first, and there's this leader who's just going to be slain by Jesus at the at the second coming, and so forth. Well, so what we can say with confidence is clearly the leader that Jesus slays is a future figure. However, there are elements of the of the letter that make it sound like this is near term. For example, he's going to sit in the temple of God, which to a first century Jew means the one in Jerusalem. And yet Jesus didn't come back by the time the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. Well, one thing that's interesting to note is there has already been a near miss um, with something like this, because back in AD 40 and 41, the Roman emperor Caligula demanded that statues of him, of Caligula, get set up in various temples, like in Alexandria, Egypt, for example. And he even mandated that they, and Caligula demanded to be worshipped as a god, he said he was even greater than Zeus, and things like that. And um, he demanded that a statue of him be put up in the temple in Jerusalem. And this caused a huge problem. It was this massive crisis. Um, the Jews of Alexandria sent an embassy to Caligula to try to stop him, to convince him to not do this. It was led by, uh, by Philo of, of Alexandria, the Jewish philosopher, was one of the people in the embassy. And we actually have his account of his and his fellow elders' interactions with Caligula, which makes for fascinating reading. Um, needless to say, they didn't convince him. But uh, what ultimately, and I won't go through the history of the whole crisis, but the um, the thing that finally solved the crisis was Caligula's own guard, who got sick of him and realized he was a crazy, dangerous, unstable ruler who needed killing. So they killed him. And that was what ultimately solved the Jerusalem temple problem. And Philo says it was divine providence. You know, God was behind this because of Caligula's blasphemous arrogance. Um, well, so we've just seen, now this is AD 41 when this is happening, and Paul's writing in AD 50. So in the mind of Paul and his readers are is this incident from nine years earlier where a Roman emperor tried to put a statue of himself as a god in the Jerusalem temple, and he ended up dying. And what Paul is envisioning is, well, something like that's going to happen again in the future. There's going to be some future man of lawlessness, presumably an emperor, who is going to, uh, who is going to uh, you know, have some kind of interaction with the Jerusalem temple where he proclaims himself as a god. And and so there's going to—Caligula was like a, a 
predecessor or early echo of something that's going to happen in the future. Well, it didn't happen by AD 70, and so and the temple was destroyed in AD 70, and so consequently what many of the church fathers said was, well, they're going to rebuild the temple. At some point, the Jewish some the Jewish people are going to rebuild their temple, and that's when this will happen. And indeed, there there are people in the Jewish community who want to rebuild the temple, and there have been various plans to do it with or without disturbing the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which are Muslim sites today. Um, but that's the uh, that's that's I guess the general solution here, um, at least if you take the text in a fairly literal way, which I think is the most probable reading there will be some kind of future temple, either on the Temple Mount or not, in Jerusalem. And at some point, the final villain of world history will will have an interaction with it where he manifests or portrays himself as a god in the temple, and then Jesus will return and and he will meet the fate he so richly deserves, just like Caligula. Uh, Jason asks the next question he says you always do a look at the faith perspective on the podcast but what has the mystery perspective of the podcast done to or for your faith what mysteries have deepened your faith what has surprised you how is catholic apologist jimmy aiken different after doing the show for five years well i don't think in terms of mysterious world having done anything for my faith, the substance of my faith is the same as it was before. I'm still the same Catholic I've always been. But I am different in that I know a lot more now about the mysteries than we've covered than I knew at the beginning. Um, In the early, you know, the first year or so of Mysterious World, I didn't cover any ghost stories after the first episode, which was just ghost theory. Because I knew theory about ghosts, but I didn't know credible ghost stories, um, you know, things that would actually stand up to investigation and scrutiny. The first one of those we really did was the wizard clip. Well, since then, I've learned a lot more. Uh, I've even be, become trained as a paranormal field investigator to investigate ghosts. So... Um, I've read a lot more of the literature, and I've got lots of ghost stories now that we can use in future episodes. Also, um, researching the show has forced me to think through various issues in more detail than I had previously. And this means that I have a clearer awareness of what's actual doctrine you know, official church teaching versus what's theological opinion. An example of that, uh, would, which I've already mentioned in this, sh- in this episode, is episode 203 on animal afterlife. Um, I had a kind of dim awareness, I think, maybe before Mysterious World started, that the idea that animals don't survive death is, is not really church teaching, but that became very clear in my mind as the show went along, and that led me to do a re-examination of the arguments that animals don't have an afterlife and look at the issue with new eyes. And I had to change my position on that. Um, I used to be a supporter of the no afterlife for animals view, but I'm not anymore. Um, So I've, as a result of doing the show, I've had to look at these issues more precisely and carefully and think through, is this really doctrine or is this just a common theological opinion? And that's led me to be more flexible because I've realized what is not doctrine and is just theological opinion. And therefore, it's like, okay, I don't have to, uh, there's liberty either for me or for other Catholics, on this issue. Regardless of what my views are, this topic, topic X, just is not something that the Church teaches, and therefore, even if there's a common Catholic opinion on it, it's just an opinion. Um, One of the things, and I've learned as a result, that the Church has openness to more things than I was previously aware. One that surprised me when I did the research on it was dowsing. I had no clue before I did the research that you had popes like Pius XI who were actual supporters of dowsing. And I had no idea that you had a statement from the Holy Office, now the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, that permitted priests even, not just lay people, but even priests are 
explicitly permitted to perform dowsing for purposes of scientific experiments. So, you know, that was eye-opening to me. Another one that is going to be coming up, depending on when you listen to this, it's, it either will or will not have been released, but we have an episode coming up on um, on announcing dreams, which are dreams that parents have about their future child. Often they have them while they're pregnant with the child, and the child will say, hi, this is me, I'm your new child, and I'm a girl, or I'm a boy, or they get to see their child and what color hair it has and various other things about the child, some of which then may turn out to be true. And sometimes they have announcing dreams before the child is even conceived. So that forced me to dig back into the church documents dealing with the preexistence of the soul. Now, I'd always read that the church rejects the preexistence of the soul, the idea that souls exist before conception. And so I've always held that the soul comes into existence at the moment of conception. But when I actually went back and looked at the documents, I was surprised because um, there are only two councils that I could find that deal with the subject, and both of them occurred early in church history, and both of them were local councils, which means that they couldn't issue an infallible teaching, and they couldn't teach on behalf of the whole church. So you had local rejection of some versions of preexistence of the soul. And that was the even more important discovery. It's only some versions of preexistence that were rejected. So even if you say these, the teaching of these councils should be binding for everyone, which it really shouldn't according to the rules, but even if you said it is, um, they only rejected the, a version of preexistence where the reason we're incarnate is because we sinned in the preexistence. So these councils didn't condemn pre-existence. They condemned the idea that we are that we assumed physical form because we sinned in a pre-existence. But if you said, well, the soul exists before conception and uh, and it got incarnate because that's God's will for it, not because it sinned, that would not be condemned by those councils. So I was surprised to learn that. Um, now, like I said, I've always still said, and I still favor the idea that the soul comes into existence at the moment of conception, but I can't tell someone they're violating church teaching if they hold uh, to some form of preexistence, especially if they don't say that we become incarnate because of sin in, in the prior existence. So those are some of the ways that my views have developed. Um, as a result of doing the research for the show. It's, it hasn't been fundamental to my faith, but on various matters, I've learned things about church openness to certain ideas that I hadn't been aware of, and I've become more sharply aware of the distinction between church teaching and just theological opinion. All right. I think we have time for one more question this time. Uh, and this question comes from Jana on behalf of her mom, Barbara. And they ask, as they say, I want to know about Veronica's veil. I've heard, A, it never existed. B, it did exist, but it's now missing. Or C, also that has been found and supposedly made of a silk material that doesn't take dye. I'm confused on what to think. Well, I'm not surprised because there are multiple cloths that have been taken to be Veronica's veil. And I, I do hope to cover this topic in future episodes. I haven't done extensive research yet, but um, but there is more than one cloth that has been purported to be Veronica's veil. For people who may not be aware, the story goes that there was a woman named Veronica. She's sometimes also given another name, but there's this woman named Veronica who was present at the crucifixion, and as Jesus was being led to the cross, uh, he, you know, he he was sweating, he was bloody, he stumbled, and she wiped his face with a cloth, and then the cloth miraculously had an image of his face on it. 
Now, this is this is a, a popular story. It appears, for example, in um, in the Stations of the Cross, but it appears late. And so, if you were to ask a scholar, "Do we have good historical evidence that this happened?" they would say no, because we don't. This woman is not mentioned in the Gospels. She's not mentioned in the New Testament. She's not mentioned in other first century or second century Christian writings. This this is something that appears later in Christian literature, after it would be plausible for a, a miraculous story like this to have survived. Because if a miracle like this happened as Jesus was on the way to the cross, you would expect it to be mentioned, you know, fairly early. Um, and it's not. So where might this story have come from? Well, um, there are images on cloth that uh, that are faces of Christ. Um, some of them are obviously painted. Um, the most famous image of Christ on cloth is undoubtedly the Shroud of Turin. And, you know, there's a debate about that, which at some point we may cover in the future, although the research is massive. So do not ask me. I don't need another round of requests for that. I've already got it on my radar. Um, but I don't know when I'm going to have time to process all the data because the literature and complexity of it is huge. Um, but having said that, if you fold the Shroud of Turin so that the face displays, which is apparently one of the ways it's been historically folded, then it looks like, okay, we got this piece of cloth with, with the face of Christ on it. How can we explain this? And it's been noted that Ver, the name Veronica can be broken into the Latin root verus, which means true, and icon, which means is Greek for image. So veronica could mean true image. And so you could say, well, here we've got this piece of cloth with the face of Christ on it. This is Christ's true image. This is Veronica's veil. And so then the story of a woman wiping his face with a piece of cloth, presumably her veil, that she just took off and wiped him with, um, may be a, an after-the-fact explanation for pieces of cloth that have Christ's image on them, uh, or at least one of the pieces of cloth like, cloth like this, and then that may have inspired other people to make similar pieces of cloth. So um, that's what I can tell you as of right now, based on the research I've done. We hope you've enjoyed this patron's question show. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is only possible because of the generosity of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and have your questions answered on future shows for patrons, go to sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com and by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. And by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. So that's it from us this time. What are your theories about any of the patron questions that Jimmy answered? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore, underscore world in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619 738 Four five one five. That's six one nine seven three eight four five one five. 
And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for their video and animation work on Mysterious World. You can hire them to do video animation and design work for yourself, and you can check out what they do by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. Uh, while you're there, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe on the videos that you watch so that it'll tell YouTube you found this video engaging, and therefore other people might as well. So you can help support the show grow, help support the show's growth by liking, commenting, and subscribing. And when you do, be sure to uh, also hit the bell notification so that you always get a notification whenever I have a new video, whether it's Mysterious World or one of the other videos I put out on a weekly basis. So, Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next time, we're going to be looking at a scientific mystery. It's a condition known as synesthesia. And for a while, some psychologists said, this is fake. This isn't a thing. It's not real. But new studies have indicated that it is real. And it's something that we're now living in a golden age of research on synesthesia. It's a very interesting condition for people who don't experience it. It can be it's, it can sound very strange, but I can give you a firsthand perspective on what it's like to experience synesthesia because I have multiple forms of it. I'm what's known as a polysynesthete. And one of the things we'll talk about next week is synesthesia's purported link to psychic functioning. Fascinating. So until next time, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.